Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from the this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillespie. I'm Chris This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Gray. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. Today we've got a, an album fight. Hashtag album fight. Hashtag do the work. And we've got two epic, monster, all-time great albums. We've got sort of different weight classes, I'd say, John. We have... The emergence of Van Halen with their debut, Van Halen. No band has ever come out swinging harder. And to take on a seasoned 11th studio album, Rumors from Fleetwood Mac, is is a significant fight. And I can't wait to see what you think of it. You're right. Nobody has ever debuted like this. I mean, really, if we think back to debuts from any band, um, there were good debuts. Yes. Plenty of people came out with good debuts, uh, but wow! I mean, this record stands up, and to a lot of people, uh, and, and Van Halen had a lot of great, great albums. But to a lot of people, this was the best they had, and yeah, it's hard to argue. Right? I'll let you do the caveat because we always have to do this to inform the audience. Okay. Well, the caveat is this. We love these albums, and that's why we're talking about them. And we're going to talk about one versus the other, and we're going to choose a winner. Each of us is going to choose a winner. But it's not because we don't absolutely love both of these records. We're talking about these albums. Know that we love these artists. We deeply, deeply have emotional attachments to these works. And we challenge you guys to go back and listen to them if you haven't heard them in a while, and chime in with your own comments. We also encourage you guys to, to buy the music, too. I mean, one of the things that we get out of this is an appreciation for music that maybe we didn't have time for before, that we haven't thought about in years, or music that we just love and artists that make it. It's because uh, look at what their music... And in this case, we're talking music from the 70s. So 40 years ago, this music was created, and here we are now making it contemporary again with a conversation that basically no one has ever thought about before. Rumors versus Van Halen? Are you kidding me? Yeah. So uh, one of them, like you said, was a debut. The other one was the 11th. I'm really trying to get my arms around that. The 11th studio record. Oh, boy. Round one. Well, we got Running With The Devil by Van Halen versus Secondhand News, Fleetwood Mac. Thoughts? In terms of the Van Halen catalog... Running with the Devil is a is a pillar of this catalog, something that they can always play and the crowd will always go bonkers for. Yeah. That's how you start a career. It right is how there. you start a career. At the, the start of the debut album, and it's how you start a career. And uh, it, it's worth saying that secondhand news, you know, I love secondhand news. The drums are way back in the mix, which I think was magical in this case. Uh, so much so that it's easy to hear this song and think of it as an acoustic guitar and mandolin jam and forget that the drums are in it at all. Yeah. And I love Mick Fleetwood, but you know they truly don't make them like that anymore unless you listen to Bluegrass. So hats off to... Yeah. you got to mention Ken Calais, <laughs> who he's done so many records from artists like the Beach Boys to Motorhead to Lionel Richie to Michael Jackson. He worked on Bad. Um, but of course, uh, his daughter is Colby Calais and he works on her records too. The other engineer on, on the album was Dick Dash, Richard Dashett. And, uh, he made a career out of collaborations with Fleetwood Mac all the way back to, he started with Buckingham Knicks. So they did yeah. a brilliant job engineering this record and secondhand news was, you know, was one of the terrific examples. But to me, it just it gets its ass handed to it by running with the devil. I do want to say this, too, because one of the things about Fleetwood Mac at this level is is they have the artist really budget to do things like we're going to play a Naga Hyde chair in this song and get that, <laughs> that sticky percussion sound. And those engineers, those producers know when to say that's too much. There's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of hate. There's a lot of anger. And there's this enormous well of things and ideas that they're pulling from. And sometimes that prog rocky kind of approach 
is great, but you're talking about a band. We're gonna look how many genres we're gonna hit. We've already hit prog rock and bluegrass. We've got scatting in this song. You know when he does that bass line during the chorus. So many different things. This is a fit fighting band that's ready to go. But I think I I have to agree with you. I went ten nine on this round. Running with the Devil is just an ass kicking song. And I think Michael Anthony. I think when Michael Anthony shows up in a song and really gets it, Van Halen has to be incredible in that song. And just that doom. Do, do, it's just, it sets the tone for what this guy's life that they're singing about, what it is. And I, I think it's an incredible thing. And it, it beats secondhand news. And secondhand news doesn't have to lose to many songs ever. But in this case, I think it does. I think it loses to it in a way that when you see a kid who, you know, the kid with the glasses who's never been punched in his life and he takes that sucker punch to the stomach, it's like, oh. Oh, God, get away from this poor kid. He didn't deserve that. And that's that's really what I think Running with the Devil did and does. Because you can really put it up against a lot of things, man. And it's tough to not just be brutalized by that song. When I look at my notes, the note I have in here towards the end is is the disco feel. There's a third genre we already talked about. But the song is tight. It's well-constructed, but it's not as good. You're right. Classic well-constructed song round two eruption (laughs) and and you would go okay eruption wins but it's got to go up against dreams i have all the respect in the world for what eruption is and what it meant and i know that eddie needs his time to to do what he does he's he's bigger than the band in so many ways and this is one of the strengths of of van halen but it's also one of the drawbacks and right here eruption oh my god it's just him saying look All of you guys get to play catch up. I'm already 10 years ahead of you and I'm going to put it down recorded. You can try to catch up. But in this song is what Joe Satriani was going to be doing in the 80s. All of those guys from that peer group were all, this is them going, oh, that's the spark. Yeah, it took a lot of either wild, uh, young, unseasoned stupidity. Or enormous brass cojones to say, I need to be left alone for a minute and a half. You guys just walk away. Let me handle this. And to put down the guitar masturbation that a lot of people, if you gave a lot of people a minute and a half, it'd be guitar masturbation. But this thing was, this minute and a half of recorded music really changed the guitar world. You can hear the sounds of the next decade. Over and over again in that song. The problem is it's going against one of the catalog defining songs of Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. And similarly, Dreams was dreamt up by Stevie Nicks. Like they, everybody else was doing something. So she went off in the back room and noodled away on a keyboard and 10 minutes later had this song. Proper respect to Eddie Van Halen. Arguably yes. the, the best who ever did it. But a minute and a half... Of, of him playing by himself doesn't just doesn't measure up the, the complete piece of work that is dreams so I, I think round two goes to dreams it's the difference making that that breakup and the pain that they're all drawing from and then the ability to go oh wait this this song is actually pretty good and being able to perform it there's a professionalism that gets them to a special place in this whole album and and this this song it's just it's not fair to eruption to play go up against that, but that's how it lines up. Round two, I think we both agree it's ten nine again, but this time going towards Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, yeah. Okay, round three, the old Kinks classic. You really got me versus never going back again. I don't really think that that this is much of a fair fight either, honestly. But oddly enough, I mean they're both sub two minute, two and a half minute songs. They they actually match up pretty good. I think you really got me, though, was an interpretation of a song that everybody uh, didn't realize how much they liked until Van Halen did it. So we do have to account for this because we've said in the past that covers, it's harder to get by on a cover. But what this song does is when you think of You Really Got Me, you think of this version. You don't think of you don't think of anybody else's version, quite honestly. Not Ray Davies' version or anybody else. Yeah. And when Ray Davies did it, he was like, hey, do a Beatles song. And he's like, I'm going to do a slightly scary Beatles song. And so he did that. This one that Van Halen delivers is not a Beatles song. 
It's not a knockoff. So it's it's almost a cover of a cover, but it's better than what either of the other two groups could have possibly put together, I think. Yeah, I mean, we probably give a little more credit to an original piece of, of songwriting because it's an original piece of songwriting. But every once in a while, you do run into a cover that somebody steals from the artist. Yeah. You know, the original artist does it, and then somebody comes and says, you know... Not only do I love this song, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to whoop your ass at it. Now, we yeah. can count those on one hand. I would say Got to Get You Into My Life by Earth, Wind & Fire was way better than the Beatles did it. Aretha Franklin's Respect, she owns that song. Yeah. People have completely she forgotten does. that Otis Redding ever did that song. Who? Exactly. <laughs> right. yeah. So those are, and what else you got? Can you think of any other cover? Well, where you... obviously, you know, you got to talk about Johnny Cash coming in and stealing a hurt because he absolutely owns that song. But, yeah. but the, this is the short list. I mean, this yeah, is it's it. a when short you list. Think of, when you think of Nothing Compares to You, mm-hmm. you don't think of Prince's version. You you think of Sinead O'Connor's version. You know, and there's, there's songs like that out there. Yeah. But but that is the Well, next Prince text. actually when never, he didn't, something. Reco- he didn't release that song as a recording of his until after she did right. it. So she really did take... I mean, he wrote that song for, for The Family, which was one of those bands right. that was really Prince's excuse to put somebody else's face on a record that he made anyway. Yeah, I, I would even <laughs> elevate that one to a to a different place for that reason, too. She That is her song. Sure. But you're right. The list is short. Whitney Houston singing... I Will Always Love You, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, Dolly Parton sings the fuck out of that song and still performs it, but Not like Whitney the Houston. version you think of is... Yeah. Yeah, so we are accounting for the cover and saying, yes, they did this. Here's the other thing. When I hear Never Going Back Again, again, it's part of this breakup album, but it's it's a little dated, and what it reminded me of was like an interlude or something you play in a movie. Like they get commissioned, hey, write something for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Oh, you know what? That song didn't work out for us. Uh, We're going to go with, you know, something by somebody. Raindrops keep falling on my head. It's that kind of song where it just, it's a marketable song. But I just think the greediness, that howl that David Lee Roth brings in, he performs this song great. And it's one of those times where Van Halen just, gets the better of a very fit and trim and excellent Fleetwood Mac, but in this case, the bombasticness of Van Halen wins. I agree. Round four is Ain't Talking About Love versus Don't Stop. Wow. We're talking about two very divergent themes in these songs. One, Uh cheerful optimism, looking for uh, the horizon. Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow, um, which is right. inextricably linked at this point to Bill Clinton's second inauguration, for better or for worse, against Ain't Talking About Love, which it's got the word rotten in it. <laughs> it's got the, I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's angry. It is. And both of these songs play nonstop. You know, these songs are iconic. And so really, whichever one you pick, you're picking a great song. And it's just one of those times where I'm going to pick one. I'm, I'm just, I have to. Okay. And for me, the the depth and the quality and the seasoning of Fleetwood Mac wins out over Van Halen here. Mm. Oh, man, it is so tough. I'm going to go with the raw, primal, dry humping <laughs> that is ain't talking about love. One of the reasons. I love it. And you're right. There's a lot to be said for the way that the, the songs have aged. There's a ton to be said for that because really, Don't Stop has has not aged a day, and it still has the sweetness. It still has the all of those things. And you know, I mean, if you want to get technical about it, you can say, oh, okay, you know, it's 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 got a timestamp on it. But Lindsey Buckingham's guitar solo is great. There's no, I mean, Eddie Van. If you want to talk about guitar solos. There aren't going to be too many songs yeah. where you go, yeah, this song was great and this guitar solo was better than Eddie Van Halen's. I, I just liked the the youthful figure of Ain't Talking About Love. Don't stop. One of the notes I had in there is if you freshened up the drums and keys, just not that they're dated, but if you freshened those two sounds up, 
that song can play right now as a debut song for somebody and still be great. Mm-hmm. It's such a powerful song. And the one thing that I do see as being a problem for Van Halen is, is just every cut is, from Fleetwood Mac is so good. It's so balanced. There's so much quality there, and they're playing with such deep emotions in this album when they get it right. They don't overreach. There's there's just no missteps that if Van Halen doesn't get it, it swings in. It can be a problem. I, I don't know what will happen next because I've got to go through my notes again, but this is such a close round for me. But I did, I did give it to Don't Stop. I did. Round five, I'm the one versus Go Your Own Way. The raw energy of Van Halen was great and still stands up. I mean, I listen to this record pretty frequently still, even though it's just celebrated its 40th birthday. I don't listen to rumors as much. But here's where the separation that you're talking about is most evident for me, because Go Your Own Way, really polished, like you said, balanced piece of work. I'm the one... You know, a lot of energy. It was pretty good, but it it just stood on the energy. It didn't really have the legs of the songwriting, and and I just go your own way. It was the clear winner in round five for me. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on this. Uh, the problem with Van Halen, where they haven't shook all these things out yet, and I don't know if they ever get it always right. Fleetwood Mac is just constantly there, constantly great. But this is where there's a little bit too much of Showman Dave, and and he has that line right before the uh, with the end. Uh, show, show, show me your love, babe. Ah, oh, yeah, show me. And then he goes, show me. You know, like with his hands out. You know, yeah, like, right. Oh man. Yeah. And then he scats and does all of the, just all of that Dave stuff that sometimes. It just isn't good enough at this level. Yeah, and the song is great. I love it. I love when Dave scats. I think it's hilarious, and I get a kick out of it. But while he's going, show me. The other lyric on the other side is go your own way. Uh huh. Like that call and response, you know. And it's just go ahead, go yeah. your own way. You We're can, gonna have a you fight. can call it another lonely day. There's so much to attach to. And so much to reflect off of on Go Your Own Way that I'm the one that's just kind of left in the dust. Some of the the way you write lyrics, too, and then how they approach it, you know, the first lyric is loving you. Mm -hmm. Damn, that just sets it up right there and it just hangs. And you're like, what happens next? Like, you just need to know, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is how fights happen amongst lovers, you know, like, of course I love you. And if you got to go your own way, then go your own damn way, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Like still love you you know and if i could there's another line if i could oh, it just hangs. <laughs> right just, i would give you the world tell me why i mean those are the lyrics that are universal that people go oh man i, I of course i've felt that way you know and and still mm-hmm. even though we can look at it now and think wow we've we all identified with it because we've all felt that when you're listening to it you're the only one. You attach yeah. to that emotion because you have felt it and it's your thing. And it's like, man, I wish I could tell somebody how good this song was. Well, guess what? 30 million people know how good this song is in 29 yeah, mi- million different ways right. than you. And it's a little different for everybody. It's universal, but a little different for everybody. And, and that's what's magical about it. And that's what's so seasoned about this songwriting and why this album was so not just good, but important, I think, for the advancing of the the art form, which I'm going to give credit to Van Halen, too, because this record was also important for the advancing of the art form. And that's why these two get to fight it out yeah. today. So. Go Your Own Way also is reminds me of, we talked about 52nd Street last week in my life, and it's the same kind of thing where we all identify with this moment, this fight, where you, you don't know, are you fighting about the end? Are you fighting about what you don't have now? Are you fighting about what you should have done? It's just so many things that we all identify with in a relationship and a fight that could be a breakup and in, in this album it just it's it fits in so nicely with what's happening there um, i also love the drumming on this song i didn't know what you thought about it oh well and it's a signature piece from mick fleetwood that shows what is so different about him his drumming is very 
I, you know, I don't know really how to describe it except to say that it's he does not waste any notes. You know, he's not the fastest, flashiest, but he's so musical and he does not mince words. He doesn't even necessarily know what he's doing because he he's a feeling drummer. Yeah. And he, like, I, I don't know. Am I a little late? I, I don't know. I, I just play it. I just play it. Yeah. When you get that right, <laughs> it stays right the whole time. You know, I remember seeing at some point, I want to say it was somewhere around 79, 80, an issue of Playboy magazine that I snuck out of my dad's uh, top drawer. And it had the music poll for Playboy magazine's music poll for that year. It showed the best this and the best that. And the, and the favorite drummer was Mick Fleetwood. And I remember even then, I must have been, you know, we were, what, 10 years old then? And I remember going, really? Mick Fleetwood? Huh. And I've never forgotten that he was voted the favorite. Yeah. And so I've always been curious as to why. And I don't mean that I dispute it, but I've, I knew that there was something there that the world got that I wasn't ready for at the age of 10. And sure. have searched for what it is that made Mick Fleetwood so important right then. Because he's so, you know, I, I hate to say these words, but let's say he's technically not the flashiest, not the, you know, he's not an obvious winner out of speed or, but what he is, is it's like Charlie Watts. Charlie Watts doesn't play anything complicated <laughs> practically ever. He just plays the most yeah. important, best thing right then. And that's what Mitt Fleetwood does. Think about this. John Bonham is still alive when this album is made. Uh-huh. And this drumming is talked about uh-huh. as a peer and as better. So there is something in there that with what he does, well, <laughs> you know, I don't know what else you say. John Bonham and Neil Peart were still doing things right then at the highest, highest level. So yep. I actually have this because, like you said, this is where the fitness of... Fleetwood Mac comes through. I actually have this as a knockdown round where, where there's such a disparity between the quality of the songs that this is a 10 to 8 round where Van Halen has to take a knee. It's a difference-making song on this album with the format that we've picked. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would uh, agree with that assessment. But if we move forward to round 6, we've got Jamie's Crying versus Songbird. <laughs> yeah. Songbird has a special place in Bay Area lore because it was recorded at Zellerbach Hall on the campus of UC Berkeley. I guess if you want to compare, this is Christine McVie's eruption. <laughs> Not really. It's, yeah. But but it is kind of. The thing is, just like eruption, as amazing as it was, uh, lost out to dreams. I think Songbird, you know, falls short of Jamie's crying. Yeah, Jamie's crying is is a at least a Van. If, if you're going to divide the eras of Van Halen up, and, and you go with uh, Van Diamond, as I like to call it, but this is one of the songs that they have to play on the tour. Does Does Sammy have to sing this song? Yeah, actually, honestly, he does. You know, it's that good. It's one of the songs that they get right. <clears throat> this is where they're they're emerging. Instead of being the best cover van of the valley, like somebody from Rolling Stone called him. Yeah, there's a whole lot of Jimmy Page in this song. But it's really good. It is really good. <laughs> you know, they really get it right. And when they don't... some The one problem that Van Halen has, I think we've talked about this, is that there's just not enough ball to go around, like a basketball team. Like, everybody needs the ball. Alex needs the ball. You have to let Michael through, because when he gets through, he gets there, and the band goes with him. But... David and Eddie also need the ball, too. Well, Michael Anthony made a career out of not not needing the ball. I mean, I think that as right. much as he deserves the ball, he's always been a passer. He's always been a, let me, I'll take the ball down court, and then I'm going to hit you underneath where you can do your thing. and Or I'll throw yeah. up an alley-oop. I mean, he, and that's what I think the, you know, his falsetto would come through as because it was the... Uh, so often unappreciated part of a Van Halen song and his bass lines. I mean, it takes a special bass player to give Eddie Van Halen the room to chord out, solo out, come back to the chords, you know, make a change, play a bridge, 
do all of the things that make Eddie Van Halen acrobatic, but still have a foundation and a trampoline uh, under under yeah. there, uh, or or the safety net, as it were. And I think that's what Michael Anthony uh, provided. Jamie's Crying is no different than many of the other tracks. I mean, his playing was so good and so under noticed i won't say underappreciated i think everybody who really yeah. cuts through I, you know i think of michael anthony i think of phil deckard and i know how important sure. he he is to phil and the and phil's playing and this record's importance to phil but i think that phil in cry wolf was the same thing where he not only provided the bass foundation but he provided the musical foundation and the supporting ability to be so strong that the rest of the band could go out on the tightrope and jamie's crime is a great example the versatility of alex van halen uh is the other thing that's underappreciated because he played so hard and so loud like john bonham that you could miss that he you know would go to the 16th notes um on the change leading into the chorus on Jamie's crying and you know it was a great thing that you didn't see too much of on rock records like this so uh, you know yeah. just unique voices on all of their parts and Jamie's crying is a great example of of all that uniqueness if go your own way is a great breakup song this is Van Halen's response and one of the things I love about this fight is you have this constant female point of view and even when the men are driving the music on the Fleetwood Mac side, it's got a softness to it because there are two female voices in there. Yeah. They are shaping the words, and it is more reflective. They're falling in love on the road with the people in the band, and that creates this great well. Here we have a breakup song, and it's sort of, we talked about Michael Hutchins in the uh, Tony, Tony, Tony in excess fight and how smoldering he was, and he's like, I've got lust, and you're going to pay the price. This is the same kind of thing where David Lee is singing and saying, you can write a letter, but you know what that's going to get you. You know, like <laughs> this is just, it's a colder male POV breakup song. Yeah. Fuck, they get that right, you know? The one thing I do want to say about Songbird, it obviously that song is beautiful. It will always be played. It'll always be this great love song. But the thing it reminded me of is and I want everybody to go do this when you get a chance. Play Songbird, just the beginning of it, and then go play Bon Jovi's Dead or Alive. And tell me that John Bon Jovi wasn't going, yeah, I'm going to make it just like Fleetwood Mac. Like, I love that Songbird song. So I'm going to make my own love song about my buddies. And I guarantee you're going to hear it and go, oh, no shit. Because Fleetwood Mac is that inspirational, that they're just throwing music out there that is moving the very best people of the next generation. Yeah. Okay. But I still find it to be a songbird losing to Jamie's crying. So the round goes to Van Halen. All right. Uh, Let's see. Atomic Punk versus The Chain. Man. Oh, boy. Yeah. The Chain is a very different piece of music uh, that refused to be ignored it lacked a a backbeat it lacked uh it was just very sparse in its in its opening and it was sparse in a way that sparse isn't even the right word it was naked tormented and oh god this is uh, this is songwriting on a different level and atomic punk was great and it was masculine and it was full of energy and if you ask you know, my 15-year-old self it would have been Atomic Punk all day long, but I'm not 15 anymore. And so the chain is head and shoulders above for me. Yeah. I, I like the punk rock nature of several of the songs on the Van Halen album, and that's why I wanted to mention that in this because the word punk is in the title. But they definitely have that, you know, Pennywise gets a lot of that that male chorus kind of thing. There's just the pacing of the song. And those are great things from Atomic Punk. But... The Chain is a different song. And again, I'm going to go to these lyrics because they're written by women and they're powerful. And if, like, man, holy shit, you don't love me now? (laughs) Jesus Christ. It's so powerful. You know, run in the shadows, damn your love, damn your lies. Yeah. That 
is heavy. Heavy. You said you weren't going to break the chain. Yeah. And this is that woman scorned, uh-huh. singing about that scorning. Yep. You motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is heavy. Different level. Different level. And if. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. And it's 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 where I, I keep get, thinking about this well of ideas and then the ability to put together music that works and not overplay it, not overproduce it, not over experiment. And then to be able to stomach each other as all of this is raging and the Coke is blowing up everybody's nose (laughs) to nail that. It's a very special, special time. You know, they're moved by the art. And I think in this case, it's just, it's overwhelming Van Halen, you know, when they get it right. And right here they do. Yeah. I read somewhere that I think it was Lindsey Buckingham said that the thing about Fleetwood Mac that made them special was that they made they they made their best music when they were at their absolute worst, you know, and not yeah. just Scott Weiland too bro- broke just up that and pain fucked where they up to. and yeah that that pain, but then they would do something to make that pain open and raw, like let's party all day. And then write this song where we're coming down hard off of a 36-hour coke binge. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. All right, so so just to keep us on track here, we have Atomic Punk losing to the chain. Both of us have it like a 10-9 round, so I'm going to... Yeah. This is an interesting round, round eight, because both both pieces of work shift gears right here. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, Christine McVie, of all the breakup shit, I mean, they were right before this album, she and John McVie had divorced. And they were only speaking music. They didn't socialize (laughs) together. They didn't converse about anything. If if it had to do with music and it had to do with a collaboration that they were going to depend on their living for, then they talked. Aside from that, they... They didn't talk to each other at all. And You Make Love and Fun was about, I think he was a lighting technician on the tour who was the the rebound man uh, for Christine McVie after her breakup. So mm-hmm. just that this album shows up on the record and, you know, her enthusiasm for singing the song and, you know, here's John McVie providing the bass line. It's like, this song is about somebody who's not you. <laughs> yeah. You know, and she, and she, and finally there's a happy tune. But the happy tune is not about him. And it, it's an interesting shift yeah. in the gears. And I think both these songs, different approaches. Again, the masculine versus the feminine. But they're very similar songs to me. Eddie is ridiculous with his hooks and how fun he's having playing this thing. And then this is where Dave the showman is great. He's on his knees begging, you know, and there are both these songs are about falling for someone yeah. and being at your best and just those looks and just like, look at me, I'm a ham. And, oh man, it's just all those little things as you fall in love and just how you see it. And I also, anytime you can bring a clavinet into something mm-hmm. and, and do something unique with it, which Fleetwood Mac does. I love it. You make loving fun. It's softer, but it's still dangerous. Just as dangerous as, as uh, Van Halen, because you're right, this is that new love and she's been hurt. It's going to be okay. Like she'd already sworn off, man, never again. God damn it. I'm never, you know, and then here she is, you know, <laughs> looking at the light. Like, Ooh, going, did you bring me a teddy bear? Oh, I haven't been brought a teddy bear uh-huh. in so many years, you know, and then suddenly it's that. And yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. You're right. Musically speaking, uh, Eddie did some really neat things. It was a it was kind of a you know solidly a Van Halen song, but kind of a departure from the darkness of the rest of this album. Feel your love tonight was pretty cool, and you know they had there was some syncopation that was cool, and there was some. It, it's a strong song, and it's a good song on this the record. Singing is great on that song. Yeah, that's true. And then we go back to Michael Anthony and that falsetto. Yeah. I also want to say that, you know, I pulled up because you, <laughs> cause you uh, had, let's see, track for track. I had to go to the track listing on Wikipedia for, for Van Halen. Mm-hmm. And 
the thing that's at the very top of my screen, because I'm looking at the track listing in the middle of my screen, is a sentence that says, On April 15, 2013, David Lee Roth was interviewed by Jay Moore for his podcast, where he selected the album as his favorite Van Halen album. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at PDA Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Now, yeah. this is such an ambiguous sentence, I'm not sure whether they're talking about the subject of the sentence, David Lee Broth, or the, uh, I guess that would make Jay the object of the sentence, when they use the pronoun he. One of these belonged to one of these guys as their favorite album. I'm going to say it was David Lee Roth, because I think Jay's favorite Van Halen album is Fair Warning. But I could be wrong about that. I just thought it was uh, neat that that's the sentence that's sitting there. Yeah, and that was mentioned on Twitter today, too, as, as we talked about these albums. Oh. Uh, so it, it's fun to mention that. How? So did you score this, You Make Loving Fun, or Feel Your Love Tonight? Which I, way did you go? I uh, lean toward Feel Your Love Tonight. You know, and I'll tell you why. Nothing musical, although I did like the music. I just felt bad for John McVie. <laughs> <laughs> I felt terrible for John McVie, so I can't let that song win. It's yeah. like, oh, somebody else makes love and fun? Ouch. Right. <laughs> and it wasn't attributed to her dog. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. I love you too. I hate you, but I love you too much to hurt you like this, so let's just uh, we'll blame it on the dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I- I'm matching you on that. Okay. It- it's-, it's a song that I wouldn't blame anybody for seeing it the other way, yep. but uh, I'll take... I'll take the men's choir over uh, You Make Loving Fun. So yeah. uh, Feel Your Love Tonight wins round eight. I think Feel Your Love Tonight aged better, too. Okay, here we go. Mm. Little Dreamer versus I Don't Want to Know. Well, the, it, neither of these songs are what make the album great. Fleetwood Mac has a deeper well of ideas and emotions and tools to draw from. But Van Halen has the bigger beach muscles, you know? They got the big biceps and the huge back and... When they put it all together, it sounds great. I don't think either band gets there in, in these songs. I mean, these are great albums, so to miss once or twice isn't that big of a deal. But this is that time when neither band is at their best. It's funny how we get to track nine of albums, and this is really like round nine of a match, and people start getting tired. And I think that's yeah. what that's what happened here. Uh, but we got to pick one. Which one are you picking? Yeah. It's not that I don't like these songs, too, but I do like... So the story behind I Don't Want to Know, you know, is that Stevie Nicks isn't even there when they're singing it, you know, and they're like, oh, i got to break the news. It's not going to be the song that she wanted. It doesn't fit into the feel of the album. They had already laid things down, and, and Lindsey Buckingham had already sang the part for her, and so they have this weird sort of duet, and that takes the song to... It's a happy mistake, a happy accident, where... Because you have the man and the woman singing the same song, the same, you know, and, and they're doubling one another, it changes the perspective enough to make the song more interesting than it might otherwise be. If this was just Stevie Nicks or just Lindsey Buckingham singing, it's not as good of a song. Yeah. And so for that reason, I, I gave it a slight edge over Little Dreamer. Because for me, Little Dreamer just... I w- that song wouldn't make it on any other Van Halen album. It only here because they just don't have all of the songs they need to do this. And they couldn't do another cover, I don't think. Even the words are just kind of, just don't make sense a lot in Little Dreamer. So I'll take, I don't want to know. I agree. Yeah, same reason. Little Dreamer's just not strong. They're feeling around for it. And they get to, wow. Like like you said, any any other Van Halen record, this song doesn't make it. Any other anybody else's record, yeah. this is a good song. But we're talking about a great album in rock history and it doesn't size up. Another reason why this Van Halen loses this round is is if your lyrics aren't tight and you get into a lyric fight with Stevie Nicks, good luck. Because <laughs> she got to a crazy place that very few lyricists ever have. Ever, ever have. Hell, I think the magical mix of Fleetwood Mac, they could have said, they could have said to one of the two engineers, hey, you guys write something. 
And I think you or I could have been sitting behind the mixing board and to hear that group of people say, Pete, we're depending on you to write something you'd probably write something yeah. greater than you thought you were capable of writing. I mean, I think there's just a magic in that combination. This goes right back to that whole thing where, you know, her feelings were hurt that her song didn't make it, but she found the art- artistic integrity to go out and and put this song out to where it needed to be. Yeah. You know, and that speaks to the, the professionalism and the seasoning and the quality people behind the glass helping them get there. Yeah. Because... uh that ain't easy, you know, and we, we've heard from Wes maybe on what it takes to put these albums together and, and they're absolutely getting something from people who don't want to give it. That, that's, that's a neat thing. Yep. All right. Round 10. Oof. Oh, daddy versus ice cream man. I really think that ice cream man is one of the great songs in heavy rock ever because of its levity, mm-hmm. because of the 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 musical interludes because of the way that it vacillates i just i think so highly of this song that i can't think of many songs that you could put it up against uh, that that it wouldn't be and and in my opinion uh it's not a fair fight when you put ice cream man up against anything you know oh daddy you know that was for mick fleetwood and it's uh yeah. i've said I love Mick Fleetwood, but I'm going Ice Cream Man. Well, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Again, we have to cover the uh, the cover aspect of it. When John Brim wrote this song, it doesn't compare to what Van Halen did. And the good news is, is that he got paid a lot of money over the years in royalties. <laughs> and he was able to do things he wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. And that's just the God's honest truth. And that falls into the category of that song belongs to Van Halen, and they pay John Brim for writing it. You know, like it's just, that's how it is. And there is a playfulness, but there's also a dark underside to this song. Because you really don't know what the fuck Dave is talking about. Ice Cream Man, like, is this like a sexual innuendo? Is it just fun? Is it Dave the Showman? And that's what Dave the Showman does. He creates this world where you're reckoning with what he means. And that's huge as as a front man to get the audience to not think about anything else but you and how you're presenting the song. Yeah. And it absolutely is a masterwork. It is a masterwork. The choice to do a John Brim song, to do a Chicago blues song, um, and specifically to do Ice Cream Man, was uh, a great choice. And what it did was it educated a generation of listeners. That's really what Van Halen did, and to David Lee Roth's credit, he had a lot to do with it. It educated a generation of hard rock music listeners to places where the roots of the music had become no longer noticed. And and this was yeah. one of the, the, the important things that made young men who were zit-faced, long-haired, guitar-playing <laughs> kids... And, and it turned him on to John Brim. Great job. Uh, this song is awesome, and it wins. The thing I want to say about this, again, is this David Lee Roth bringing home a song like he knows how to do. I got a little nervous with Eddie because there's a lot of him in this song, but it, that's part of the fun of Eddie. He's on that high wire, uh-huh. and he's doing backflips, and you're supposed to be <laughs> nervous that it's going to be too much. Uh-huh. You know, And he stayed clean. He stayed up there. It's like, oh, thank God. He didn't. He didn't go for that triple backflip. He he just he did all the tricks. It was great, and oh, okay, good. You know that's when Van Halen gets it right. He bothered to stick the landing. Yeah, it, sometimes he bites off too much, and you're like, I, I I wish you would just let this song be the song, but he he gets to decide that, and and I, I I get to deal with it. And on this song, I love it. I love how he did it. Definitely, we agree. It's it's ten nine. And so the last big round, yeah, wow, it has come down to, uh, and this is a great fight, but it has come down to. Uh, let's see, what has it come down to? My goodness, on fire. And Gold Dust Woman. Uh Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. Gold Dust Woman is strong. But we, last week, had a conversation on Twitter about album closers. And as much credit as we have given the Van Halen debut for being a debut, one of the reasons that it's a great debut is the way they brought it home. 
and they brought it home hard and heavy and and with fire uh yeah. i'm leaning on fire on this one it was their big closer and it was their statement of we're here motherfuckers you got to deal with us and and I, wow. and I yeah and i love it well i go the other way <laughs> honestly I, I think stevie i think stevie's song is is perfect. Like we hadn't really dealt with the drugs and everything that they were doing. They hadn't really realized it, but they had opened for Jimmy. They had opened for Janice. They had seen it just a few years. I mean, think about it. this is five years after those people had died and they're in the studio, what, four years later. And so she's writing this thinking, is, is, is this us? Are we doing the same thing? Are we, you know, are we doing this? And oh, wow. And so the words, the self-reflection, I, I just, I think they closed the album out strong. But this is the whole thing with me, with Fleetwood Mac on this album. This the well of ideas, the emotions, the the thought of saying, hey, we're going to break glass in time with your singing so that there's this, this danger and these, these problems that are being, you know, who thinks of doing that but a band that is well-seasoned, well-engineered, well-produced. And, and they, they, they pull it off for me. They really, whatever Van Halen needed to do, they did in the song before with Ice Cream Man, but they weren't able to do the same thing here. And so uh, I give it to Gold Dust Woman. Wow. It was also that you, I mean, as you describe it, the breaking of glass, that's gimmicky, but it wasn't gimmicky for Fleetwood Mac. Like it was in their hands, it was purposeful. Well, we have a bit of a problem because it appears, if my math is right, that we've got to split this in. <laughs> And the funny thing is, is we're so close on so many of the things. We both saw that the the taking a knee, uh-huh. you know, and we both saw a lot of ten, nine, nine, ten rounds, but but we disagreed on round eleven. We disagreed on round four. Ain't talking about love versus don't stop. Mm. Wow, that's enough to make a. We don't have a winner from what we have, and that means we have to go to Richard Lackey, and I'm going <laughs> to see if I can pull him up or, or right now. Richard, save us, Richard. Oh man. So uh, Richard went with my choice last time, and I, I and I appreciate that, but I'm not feeling all that confident. It, it, this was a tough one, Richard. It was very tough. I came up with Van Halen one, edging out rumors, and Pete came up with rumors, edging out Van Halen one, and once again, close, 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 too close to call. Just so you know, you are correct. <laughs> you know what? I I think. Uh, uh, some of it for me was just the overpowering energy yeah. had a lot to do with it, a lot Absolutely. to do with it. But I will say there was there was a moment where rumors was going to win, but oh. that damn round eight, killed oh, me. it hurt. It hurt me to make a decision. I almost tied it, but this is um, you make love and fun versus feel your love tonight. Oh, <laughs> I went the same way on round eight, and I originally went Fleetwood Mac. Okay, but something didn't sit right with my gut. I just something, okay. I just, just something wasn't right, and then okay. I got all worked up because I'm getting down to eight, nine, ten, eleven, and it was looking like it might be, it might go rumors, and I was like, okay, well, you know, it's probably one of the what top five best albums of the '70s, maybe, you know, as far as popularity and stuff. But something still wasn't sitting right with my gut. Thirty million and, people would agree with you. And well, what, what, was, what was that? Uh, Wayne and Garth, you say that, that it came in the mail with boxes of t- with samples of Tide or something like that. Um, but and I hate it because I kind of dumped on Christine McVie this whole time. Mm. But it's just something about it. I, it's I mean, it's an iconic song of theirs and everything, but just the energy of your love. We all had that going to Van Halen, just so you know. So so where else did you feel like it was... Tell, can I tell Go you ahead. why I, I went with Feel Your Love? I, I went with Feel Your Love because it was the winner. But right. what made it easy was that You Make Love and Fun was about Christine McVie's rebound guy, and he was a lighting tech on the tour. Mm-hmm. She and John McVie had just divorced. So I felt like you fucking bitch. It's a little, uh, little, 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 little uncool. But I mean, you're talking about literally one of the one of the gr- probably the greatest breakup album in the history of rock and roll. Absolutely. So, so it 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 completely thematically. I, I just the the song is a little bit, and this is one of my kind of reference points. Is 
over time has become kind of a Dockers ad, and it kind of <laughs> loses. It's it's songs that kind of lose their cool. Uh, because yeah. the kind of how they come through, come down through the years, through the through the zeitgeist and everything, and yeah. it's just it's a little bit. And feel your love tonight is just so much energy and just so tight and just. I I, I kind of I put a note that this is this is heart versus crotch uh-huh. as far as the two albums. We're talking about happy new courtship. Yeah, but you asked other tight tight ones, and one that surprised me was round eleven. Okay. Uh, Gold Dust Woman versus On Fire. Mm-hmm. Be- now I ended up giving it to Gold Dust Woman, but I almost went with On Fire because it's such an outlier for the album. And I, for me, I, what made it the perfect closer? Pretty, pretty damn good. I heard uh, this is the first time. I mean, I, I mean, I know Van Halen won frontwards and backwards. I've heard, you know, I've heard it since I was probably twelve, thirteen years old. But um, I, I, for the first time, I heard some remnants of future thrash metal in there in, in in a couple of riffs it hit the the punk lover and thrash metal lover in me and and, and i just something i'd never noticed before because i thought i thought that was going to be a wash the gold dust woman but i all it almost that that was a close one that almost went tie but but then it just i can't go against stevie you could definitely hear the influence that punk was having on how Eddie played and the pacing and everything. Especially this album, because there's a few songs that are just uh, classic, iconic Van Halen sound. In fact, where, where they're kind of coming into that sound that you're going to hear in the next few albums, and especially even going into 1984. Tell me how you did round four, because that was one where John and I diverged a little bit. Ain't talking about love versus don't stop. This was the easiest round for me. I freaking hate don't stop. I can't stand it. It, it was ruined in the 90s. Um, this is not a political statement, but any time political campaign, I don't care which side it's on, adopts a song, it's ruined. Because all I can see when I hear Don't Stop are a bunch of middle-aged people in suits and power ties dancing the white guy underbite to that song. And I can't I can't take it seriously anymore. I can't. I hate it. I absolutely hate that song. So Ain't Talk About Love, which is one of the better songs on that album anyway. Just It, it wasn't even close. So, Pete, you picked Don't Stop, didn't you? I did. I picked Don't Stop because I, I tried to wash my 90s-ness away because, I like you, I, I had disdain for the song. I was able to do it. Let me ask you this. We both had, in round five, Show Your Love versus Go Your Own Way as being Van Halen having to take a knee because... You know, the ball go kept your, staying high. Yeah, Go Your Own Way is the single greatest breakup song in the history of rock and roll. And maybe the best pop song to come out of the 70s. Or soft, soft rock. I, 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 I probably, after, after I went through all 11 rounds, I probably listened to Go Your Own Way five times. That song is, it is a, I, like, I don't know what to, what do you call that? Do you just call them rock? Do you call them, I, 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 some people might, might hate the term, but like yacht rock or soft rock or something. I don't, I don't really know how to categorize them. They're not bound by genre. They, they do whatever they want. They played, they played Western. They played country. They played bluegrass. They played so, everything in that album. So you whatever know, they, don't have they are, they that don't might be genre. the greatest song of whatever it is they are. Now, my favorite of theirs, though, on this album is The Chain. But, oh, yeah, we talked about that, too. Um, I mean, you're echoing is, a lot of the points that we made on this show, man, really. Yeah, the, the chain was so strong and so divergent. From, that, yeah, that was another one. Even though, I, even though I, I like Atomic Punk for it being a little bit different, it wasn't even close. I, the chain won before it even started. The one thing I do want to say about Atomic Punk that I didn't say earlier in the show uh, was the scratching, the proto-scratching on the guitar that Andy Van Halen does. That's direct line straight to Tom Morello. Once again, more Joe Satriani style Mm -hmm. licks just done before Joe had done them. So even though Atomic Punk does lose to the chain, Mm. we all agreed on that. God damn, there's a lot of influence in that song over the Mm. next 15, 20 years after it was played. So two huge albums, two enormous. I mean, like to say the best rock pop song to come out of the 70s, plus the best breakup song. I mean, that's just enormous kudos to throw on an album that at the end doesn't have its hands raised and and uh good on van halen for coming out hard like they did it's it's just it's just the energy when you listen to this this does not sound like a first album 
at all. That's the, one of the first notes I made on Run With The Devil. It's like, this does not sound like the first song on a band's first album. It sounds very mature. You know and what it, it really says? The, the, for the beginning of this record sounds like Bo Jackson in his rookie season hitting a first, hitting a home run at his first at bat. And, and then to put an instrumental second? Balls. Balls. Balls That's exactly the size what, of, yeah. Round two, the balls to to go you know, solo, you know second that song. That, yep, that's exactly what I wrote. I'm going to take your Bo Jackson thing, and I'm going to make it even better. The first thing Bo Jackson does in his first at-bat is he crushes a home run right down the left field line, but he hits so high, the umpire can't decide if it went around the foul pole or curved in front of it. It turned out it was actually a home run, but they, they made him bat again. So the next thing he does, right, this guy hits a rocket to left field in his first at-bat. <clears throat> Doesn't count. He hits a two-hop ground ball to the second base and legs out a single. And everybody's <laughs> like, wait, how did you, what? I mean, how many people beat out a ground ball single to second? He beat the throw. So, there you go. He That's exactly like, all right, that doesn't work. Now, now is this yeah. the best album from both of these, yeah. do you think? Yeah. Because that's kind of the conclusion I came to. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't know. I think Van Halen got it right. Did they get it right more times in the same album later on? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to argue with. This is such a great album. I, I don't know if 1984 or OU812 no, or 51. I, cause, cause they, of those every one of those you're gorgeous. mentioning, I, I feel like there's two or three filler. And, and to be honest with you, even the ones that I felt were a little bit weak aren't anywhere. They ne- Nothing felt like filler at all in this, uh, this album. Nothing. And really, rumors, only one or two felt fillery to me. Maybe one. Well, it's actually. Maybe just they, were Daddy. So, they were all so pissed off. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's an entire album of what two couples breaking up. It's fantastic. Uh huh. And then I will also say that it's that classic syndrome of you've had all your life to write this first record, and then the second record comes out. And Van Halen too. I'm a big fan of Van Halen too. I liked it a lot, but it was a sophomore effort. Yeah, it's got yeah. filler. It's got great. It's got great great songs, but it's got filler. I mean, in fact, they had 20 years to live out experiences and, and fall in love and get brokenhearted and all that stuff to write that first album, and then a year on the road to write the second one. Most of my favorite albums from most bands are first albums. I just think once they get wealthy that they lose something. I, and I don't, since, I didn't, since I'm not privy to, to the original conversation, uh-huh. I'm just curious if it was mentioned because I know there's going to be a lot of Eddie Van Halen worshiping. But was there talk about Mick Fleetwood? Oh, yeah. Okay, because for sure. he oh, makes yeah, for sure. Go Your Own Way in the Chain. It, if not for him, those songs aren't those songs. Well, and oddly enough, he does something for secondhand news that you don't even realize he's there. And, you know, yeah, uh, yeah we do, there was a lot of Mick Fleetwood. I mean, he's so Just, subtle, but he doesn't waste a single note. He new, does not waste. Because, I mean, Eddie Van Halen, we all know who Eddie Van Halen is. Yeah. And everything is fantastic and revolutionary and all that kind of stuff. But Mick, Mick Fleetwood just, man, he is so good on those two, on, on all the songs, but on those two songs in particular, I just really wrote a lot of capital, capital letters. You know, I don't know how, it, this is not a fair comparison, but if you take like a Cher costume with all the fucking headdress and the glitter and all that shit, and that is spectacular and you can't ignore it. And that's, Eddie Van Halen's playing, right? And it deserves every. And I love Eddie Van Halen. I, I you know, you, I'll never have enough words. But Mick Fleetwood is just that chick in a cocktail dress with those badass hips, and she's just wearing that black cocktail dress again. But Jesus, this was extremely difficult, but a lot of very fun and yeah. satisfying too. I was desperate to have this conversation after I had finished my analysis. Like all day, I'm like, I just have to get this off my chest. Well, Pete, I was done about four o'clock, so uh, we could have had the conversation, you know. <laughs> that, that was, that was, I was the hold up. <laughs> but Richard, I will say this, man. I am elated at how right you got this. Uh, isn't it amazing? <laughs> and I, now, now, who are you, Michael Jackson and, and Billy Joel? Where did you go? I was John? Michael Jackson. I was too. Yeah. See, I was really happy that you got that right as well. <laughs> yep. I'm gonna find a new third judge. That was another very, 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 very close one. 
But this is what's incredible about this exercise is you get to go back and really look at things and look at the lyrics that were written and in, in, in the context of the times and all these different things and really get a chance to examine these albums. I never would have thought that Van Halen 1 and Rumors were even anywhere near each other. But here they are. Like there's a breakup song that's followed by a breakup song. And this is the male's version and the female's version. All these points of contrast. Oh, so good. And speaking of lyrics, I had forgotten how good the chain is. It's so fucking good. I remember. I remember the first time I ever heard it. Like and really, like I, I probably heard it a million times before on radio and stuff like that. But the first time I ever, as a, a, an adult, I guess I was a young adult, and I heard that all the way through. And that and right where it stops and it starts the bass line, uh-huh. and just being like, oh. Why am I twenty, twenty-one years old and just fucking hearing this for the first time? Yeah, I think I, I think I bought that was right when their greatest hits came out. So it was like ninety-one, something like ninety, ninety-one, when their Green Greatest Hits album came out. I remember buying that CD immediately after that because I, I don't think think that fucking song's on it either. It never gets the credit it should. Yeah, it's true. But speaking of lyrics, I just want to say that I, I'm not I'm not a huge lyric guy like like I think Pete is. Uh huh. But I do want to point out the greatest line that David Lee Roth ever wrote as a pickup line is, you know you're semi-good looking. <laughs> I know. So and good. how <laughs> – because like I said, I didn't write – you know, I'd write, oh, good lyrics or something like that. But it's the only set of lyrics that I actually wrote down just because that line is so – what is that called? Doxing? Uh-huh. Where you just kind yeah. of put the girl down just enough to where she's interested in you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that line is that line is so perfect. It just it's just so perfect. Semi good looking. Yeah. No, that whole song, that whole lyric is powerful. It and it does. Oh, it's such a good song. And and I wish I could have. Actually, I don't think I picked. I think I picked uh, whatever the fourth song. That's was. don't stop. Yeah. It's like God awful. Right. Fucking Dockers ad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But let me ask you a question. This I'm going back to the chain again. I keep going back to it, but. Where is that music? You don't. You can't hear that now, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Um, I said these words. They don't make them like that anymore. I said uh, this song can only be from the seventies. Is exactly what I write. You don't hear this. Yeah, you don't. You, maybe don't like that anymore. Me, but I did write maybe Arcade Fire, maybe Fleet Foxes touches that. But just the, just the whole structure of that song, you just don't hear the kind of bombast and audacity at the end of a song like that especially a song that's not necessarily quote-unquote heavy Mm -hmm. but it's just got that just killer last final you know final portion of i just you just can't hear that music it's a shame nobody writes even they didn't write music like that after no i think jack white he could get close to something in his side projects yeah sure but would he get there that many times? Like in this album, I mean, go your own way. You could have the same conversation about no, that. I mean, who was writing that song you, right you now. Do, you do not, no, you don't hear, like, especially, I mean, you would, one would argue this is 70s pop, or what, what pop would have been in the 70s. This isn't, you're not going to hear this on pop radio. No. Nothing that... It's, this is a real advanced adult music with adult themes and adult problems. Yeah, this and adult is, execution. And you, yeah, you might get it at 16, but that's only because the parents in the room showed you how. You know, like, yeah, this, this is... This is advanced music, for sure, on both ends. I don't... That music exists out there right now, but I just don't think there's a strong of a market for it, maybe. Just a, a whole band of people fucking each other and, and fucking each other over and drugs. And what bands do that anymore? What bands have that much internal conflict and stay together because they make great music? Yeah, and right, and then hang in there. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then record an album about it. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And then record about, what, five or six others after that? Or three, four, however yeah. many they did after? And had really their biggest success two, three albums down from that. And yeah. they just announced, I think today, like their farewell tour. You know, they're still Everybody's farewelling. It. You know, the, 90, yeah. the 90s brought all of them back, you know. I mean, unfortunately, they brought the Eagles back too, but that's another discussion. But they are, you know, listening to this album, they are underappreciated. Even though I knew all the songs and I, 
and all that stuff, I, I just don't think they're appreciated for, for how good they were. Because that, al- that album is damn good. It just was, it was one filler song that killed them. Hard to please around here. Yeah. And Tough one crap. of the things that's always fun, John and I like to talk about, is you never in their wildest imagination did they all think that they would have this happen to them, where their music would be collided 40 years later and, and judged with such fervor and uh, with detail. You know, so this is... Uh, this is what makes it great, because this is them just doing what they do, and, and if they purposely went out and wrote an album to beat the other other band, we would have, I think, a less rich experience. But here I am sitting in a beanbag talking with friends about music, and uh, that's the whole point of this exercise. It's crazy, isn't it? This is one that I, that I, t- I told, no, I, I said it on Twitter. I, I listened to, I don't know how many of the songs on here again, two, three, four times. And then started just listening to other music, kind of, kind of stream of consciousness for about another hour. Just sat there and listened to music. So, this was this was a very sad. In fact, after the first two rounds, I was like, "Who picked these two fucking albums?" And fuck you. And by the end of it, I was like, "Thank you. Who did this? Thank you." It was yeah, so weird because I, I was so mad at the beginning of it because I was like, "This is gonna, <laughs> this is just gonna suck. <laughs> it's gonna be impossible to figure this out. It's gonna be." But then it just turned out it just very very satisfying. So kudos. If it was an accident that we ended up with these two albums, but well, see that's happy accidents. Yeah, I have to thank Richard Lackey for again doing the work for pushing the work for absolutely getting to the essence, and for once again getting the damn thing right. No, uh, correct. Yes, it, right. That, you know, I think um, you and I agreed on two. I think there's going to be a hundred, so uh, I'm not. I'm not going to claim that I have the uh, recipe just yet, but I will say that I really appreciate the conversation. I'm glad, Pete, that you and I got arm wrestled to an exhaustive tie on this one that we had to bring Richard in because uh, that was great and it was worthwhile. And Richard, thank you very much, man. Thank you, too. This was a blast. Van Halen won. Goes down the champion this time.